One of the things we have in Middle Tennessee that are so incredible are all of these historic homes and gardens. And I'm here at Carton Plantation in Franklin, Tennessee with Justin Stelter, who has been the head gardener here since 2003? Yes, sir, July of 2003. So uh, almost 11 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, tell us a little bit about the garden here. The original garden was to our space here to the east and south of the house. But in 1847, John, Randall's son, takes over the house mm -hmm. after his father's death. And we have a letter that says, John is bucking around Carnton again. And this is not an exact quote. Right. He's bucking around Carnton again, and he's uh, added the front porch and the back porch, uh, created a, a, a walkway, and removed the garden. And we're standing on that walkway that was created in 1847. And so this is 167 years old, roughly. You do the math, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and again, the garden that was originally there, the, the kitchen garden, for, for Randall and, and his wife, John, the son, moves and creates a much larger garden right. to the west of the house. So what was over here probably was more a functional garden, that, that's really, correct. than an aesthetic garden. That's it, correct. It was a kitchen garden. It might or might not have had some cutting there flowers some, in yes, it, sir. but probably it just, just provided food that, for the family and that, those that's, who lived here on the is, property. Is what we know about the garden, it was just an early, sort of simple garden. Right. So we have an early photograph from 1869 that shows the front of the house. And what you see in that photograph are some overgrown cedars and boxwoods placed just like this. And uh, we think that was part of the reinterpretation that John does of the front entrance uh, mm -hmm. of planting because based on the size of the trees in the photograph, uh, the cedars would, would, it would make sense if you planted them at four or five or six feet tall within 20, you know, let's say he puts the garden in in 1847. Mm -hmm. By the photograph, 1869, that's 22 years later. Right. These trees are overgrown. It's a testament to not pruning properly and not caring for your entrance. Mm -hmm. But, but by all accounts, what he's doing is he's making a more grand entrance. Right. He's created this alley that, that's that sort of guides you to the front door. Mm -hmm. So once the garden was moved, it was moved kind of to the back or the, the side of the house, really, the, toward the back. Yes, sir. So we have a letter from John McGavick, who essentially inherits the house, takes over the house in 1847, mm -hmm. that says he's removed the garden. And that simply means he moved the garden to this west side of the house. Uh, he, he created a garden that's about an acre in size, and it's based loosely on an A.J. Downing design. Tell me a little bit like about the brick edging. How do you know things like that existed here? In the mid-1990s, we, we hired a consultant to come in and sort of read our landscape. And we were looking for where the garden, the original garden, where it was moved to because we knew it was removed. And so archeologists started doing excavations and they would do these, these, regular, these rectangular digs, uh, cross sections, mm -hmm. looking for what was buried under the earth. And routinely they found brick shards. And, they, and the, as they plotted out where they were finding the shards, they found enough to show that this was the layout. These were the walkways for this garden. And then the consultant that we hired, Jerry Doyle, knew enough about mid 19th century gardening to know that this was based on, again, on an A.J. Downing design. Sort of design. Mm -hmm. So really and truly, the paths that we're walking today are were put in in 1847. Right in the same yes. place where they were put in in 1847. Yes, sir. Yep. You've got to remember, this is interpreted as a kitchen slash ornamental garden Okay. Uh, with, again, those Italian formal influences. Here are two great examples. Right. For example, the boxwoods on each corner to represent this round, a beautiful sort of formal shape, and juxtaposed to that would be the conical cedars that Again, our, our southern or American version of the Italian cypress. Right. So Italian cypress obviously wouldn't grow here and may not even been avail available That's in right. the middle 1800s. That's right. But what did, what did they have at their disposal mm -hmm. that they could use to give that same sort of look? That's right. And another interesting thing about it is the, the microclimates that you see it creates mm -hmm. for, for particularly for shade loving plants. Okay. Uh, so on the, on the eastern side, you know, it would, it would, in the afternoon, you'd have some great shade. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And those sort of, one, provide year-round interest in the garden, even when the beds aren't necessarily planted, uh, but also in the summertime when these are full of vegetables, provide a nice green backdrop and some real architectural value. Yes. For those that are vegetable gardeners, mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to make a vegetable garden look beautiful year-round. Right. And so we border each of our vegetable beds 
with ornamentals mm -hmm. just for beauty it's pure aesthetics and again probably something that would have been done in Mid a similar style in middle 1800s and from what i've read you know as, as we progress as we move forward in the in the development of gardens in america mm -hmm. we're moving from just a pure kitchen or function type right. of garden into a be beautiful <laughs> yes into a beautiful aesthetic type garden exactly. and leeton writes two or writes several great books on early american gardening mm -hmm. and the and the first has a subtitle for meat or medicine leading me to believe that the gardens were initially built for to provide food right. and, and medicine and medicine and, and the next is the next subtitle of, of her second garden book on early american gardens is for comfort and affluence so if you take those two subtitles and, and lay them next to each other you can kind of see the progression the sure development. sure and and within these ve we've got eight vegetable quadrants that mm -hmm. surround the center of our garden we do four crop rotations okay. per year uh, so we'll do an early spring a late spring, a, a, a late summer, and an early winter, mm -hmm. or late summer, early fall. Right. And the, the vegetables that are produced in each of these approximately 20 by 20 quadrants mm -hmm. will be donated or auctioned off, and that money will then be given to the homeless or to those in need. Cool, so the, not only does the garden provide uh, beauty here and something for visitors to Carton to see, but it also does good in the community. It does. It's a real win, uh, it's a win 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 situation because the volunteers get some training on how to grow these right. plants. Carton uh, gets the help for free, and the, and the, and the tourists get, get to see a beautiful garden, right. and then those in need. So, one of the interesting things that I've noticed when I've been out to Carton is that there are really vastly different fence styles in yes. different places. Is that actually original? Yes, we, we have a, an early photograph, 1869, that shows this solid board fence. Mm -hmm. Solid board fence follows the north and west side of the garden. Okay. Thomas Jefferson has one in his garden. Now his was to protect pests or to keep deer out. Right. Ours, we interpret it as extending the growing season. Mm -hmm. You can plant up to two weeks earlier in the season and, and harvest two weeks later. Because the fence is blocking that north and northwesterly cold. That's exactly you know, right. Fall wind as the winter yes. sets in. So we're creating a, a microclimate, especially in that corner of the garden. Mm -hmm. So you, you compare that solid board fence, which is not very aesthetically pleasing, it's more functional, right. with then just your common picket fence. Uh -huh. uh, and this is a lower fence. It's designed for beauty, it's designed to frame or create the outline of the garden, and it helps prevent some pests from coming in. Of course, a deer can jump in, and honestly, our rabbits still come in. But this is on the house side so that you can see into the garden. And then what some people point out is we have now a third interpretation of a fence over here, and this was the, the McGavick Plantation. They, they did raise uh, horses and uh, among other uh, livestock, and so this would be a traditional uh, horse kind of rail fence. Livestock fence. Yes, and, and we know that the barn was back in, on this north side. So we, you know, while we, we, we try to interpret all the styles of fences that were here at the property. Now we're kind of strolling through the rebuilding of, of the arbor. Yes. It's here along this kind of western edge of the garden. And again, I, I'm sure because everything else here is so historically accurate that there is evidence that this actually existed here. Correct. Previously. Part of the, the digging that the archaeologists did back in the 90s uh, uncovered cedar shards or cedar remnants mm -hmm. in this area. Okay. And they were fairly evenly spaced about every eight feet. So we didn't know what was above ground. We didn't have any photographic evidence or, or images. So we this was before my time, you have to understand. Right. So I'm, I'm talking with some liberty here, but, right. but the powers that be at that time said, well, in order to correctly interpret history, we need to show that there was cedar every eight feet along this western uh -huh. edge and what would likely have been here. So they found this design for an arbor with these pods at each of the, at the culmination of each of these pathways. Right and uh, they raised the money and, and built this great, we call it our cedar arbor. Uh -huh. And it's made out of, ju out of Juniperus virginianus, the eastern red, red cedar. cedar yeah. It was put in in the 90s, mid, mid to late 90s, and what you see now is 18 years of deterioration and, along with a windstorm. And about three weeks ago, this arbor blew over, and so now we're in the process of rebuilding it. Uh -huh. So you know, out where I'm originally from, these uh, 
Osage oranges, like this magnificent specimen here, really were a functional plant, but mm -hmm. they came east of the Mississippi, kind of mid-1800s, we think. Mm -hmm. And here, they had a kind of a different purpose. Well, Peter Henderson writes several gardening books in the 1850s, and in one of those, he says, any man of grandness, any estate with beauty would plant an Osage orange tree because of the, the stature of the tree yeah. itself. And I've got a funny story. When I first became the head gardener here in July of 2003, there were rumors that this Osage orange tree, oh, it must be 500 years old because it's so big. I mean, look at the size of this tree. And so we cored the tree and we found out that it actually dates to 1847. And it's not one tree, but it's three trees. You know, a common name for this is the Bois de Arc. Right. Uh, uh, pardon my French. It's, it's, a, it's a very dense yellow wood. Um, it, when it's burned, it's intensely hot. And, uh, and the Indians used it to make bows. Right. So really, it was a very rare tree east of the Mississippi, and it was used as a status symbol, whereas out west, it was truly used for cattle fencing. That's right. L Lewis and Clark, uh, reportedly bring back the first Osage Orange east, east of the Mississippi, although there, you know, I had Tom, uh, I had um, Peter Hatch, mm -hmm. former garden director at, at Monticello out here, and he said, you know, Justin, there's a, there's a tree that they can prove is older than Lewis and Clark's expedition in Virginia, and so they think that might have been early Indian trade. But regardless, the, the tree became popular in the east after Lewis and Clark did, right. made their, made their right. trip out west. And it's just, uh, it's a magnificent tree. It's a strong tree. Right. Uh, of all of these things that are going out on out here, you're the head gardener, but you don't do all of this by yourself. Absolutely not. We, we have a lot of help. The first thing I did uh, as, as the head gardener, among the first things I did was I joined about 20 local gardening organizations. Some of the most important, some of the most interactive here at Carnton are the Williamson County Master Gardeners. Mm -hmm. I've had help over the years from Cornelia Holland and the and then Middle Tennessee Hosta Society. Right. I've had a lot of help from Andy Owen and the Nashville Rose Society and uh, Becky Fox Matthews and the Middle Tennessee Daffodil, Daffodil Society. Yes. So I'm not an expert on any one plant. Uh, when I need help, I, I reach out to the community and, and this really is a community garden. Well, and speaking of the community, obviously this is a destination for travelers, not only residents of Middle Tennessee, but travelers to Middle Tennessee, That's Nashville, correct. the Franklin area. It's open year round. We'll expect 70 plus thousand visitors this year. Well, and we'll also put up some information on the Volunteer Gardener website, which is mm -hmm. volunteergardener.org. Mm -hmm. And Justin, I just want to take a minute to thank you for letting us come out see this beautiful place and we hope to come see you again soon. Thank you very much, Troy. There is a unique opportunity here at Carton to uh, visit with a group of true uh, Southern historians and not just historians, but garden historians. May 15th, 16th and 17th of 2015, the Southern Garden History Society's National Convention will be here in Nashville. Anyone can join the Southern Garden History Society and it will be a really unique opportunity to see not only Carton, but also other historic gardens around Nashville.